boxes inside. Now, you take my best one. Ah, I Was I in any of them?
Good morning. Um, for those who are in the back, come and grab a seat. Um, let's stand together and let's worship this morning. Please stand.
good singing you may be seated at this time we'll have announcements and the Sunday school is dismissed well good Palm Sunday morning to the rest of you how was everyone this morning I don't know, Mark. I'm going to do a little more to warm them up for you, I think. That was kind of, let's try it again. How was everyone this morning? There we go. Okay, I think that we're, you're, you're better now, Mark. That's good. Uh, we're uh, happy to have as our speaker this morning our brother Mark Colchin. I have a little uh, biography here for him. He's a graduate of Wheaton College, was commended to full-time work in 93 from Bethany Bible Chapel in Silverton, New Jersey. He's a board member for America's Keswick. Uh, the Pines at Whiting, and the Senior Living Facility. He's also editor of Cornerstone Magazine and founder of Know the Word Ministries. 
uh, and he's active in hosting um, various regional conferences and webinars. Um, and actually, since there's one webinar coming up on Monday, perhaps I'll let, I have a flyer on it, but I'll let you maybe introduce that? Okay. Um, then uh, we have our activities through the week. Monday, there's the Bible study at 10 a.m. here in the fellowship room, also available on Zoom. Wednesday at 7 p.m. Uh, in the fellowship room and on Zoom is our church prayer time. And then this being the, uh, uh, the Easter week or Holy Week, it's, um, we have our Good Friday service, 7 p.m. this Friday. I want to invite everyone to come back for that as we celebrate uh, the crucifixion of our Lord. And then on Sunday will be uh, Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, and certainly everyone's invited back for that as well. Um, forgot. To for Sunday is um, Ken Barrett. Um, I forgot to announce this morning the family of the week. I happen to know this person all my life. It is my mother, Carol McKenzie. So, the worker of the week, uh, Gerard and Mickey DiMatteo, uh, they're uh, full-time workers at Rutherford Bible Chapel. So we can keep those in prayer for the week. Um, in addition to a Know the Words uh, webinar that's on Monday that uh, Mark will introduce, there's also the Women's Spring Missionary Conference uh, on Saturday, April 20th at Valley Bible Chapel, 9.30 to 1, uh, 30 p.m. And I believe there's more information on the back as well as a, uh, a sign-up or an RSVP. For prayer requests, um, we have uh, Pat Hobbinger, Recovering at Home, uh, Marion Muller, um, and John Muller, uh, Marion's at uh, Birchwood Rehab in Cranford, uh, and I was corrected, apparently John is not at the VA, he's also at Birchwood, as it turned out. So they're both in the same place, I don't know if the rooms are adjacent, or, um, but in any case they're, they're not far apart, but, but not together either, so we can certainly pray for them. Um, and then also just another note about um, uh, Diane Cirillo's sister, Pat, uh, recovering from pneumonia and bronchitis and had COVID before that up in Morristown. And uh, she's you know, recovering but still having difficulty breathing so we can continue to pray for her. Uh, any other um, prayer requests? Anything that I missed or any other? Okay, uh, let's go ahead and go to prayer then. Lord God, we're just so grateful to you, grateful that we can uh, look back and remember, uh, especially as we consider this week, when we celebrate it in particular, we look back and remember your death on the cross. Uh, Lord, the, the cry there that it is finished, that, that, that work of um, having all the sins of the world placed upon you is finished, and you were going to die with all those sins that we might be saved. Lord, we thank you for that salvation. And we thank, especially thank you as we consider that that wasn't it but that three days later you arose from the dead. Lord, thank you that we serve a living God. Um, that is just a, so, so important to us and such a comfort to us to know that you are currently in heaven and at work uh, working for us. Father, we think of um, these different uh, events through this week. We think of uh, Mark Colchin as he comes to sp uh, speak now. Lord, we pray that you would empower him with your spirit to speak your words. We pray for the... Uh, the Bible study on Monday, the prayer meeting on Wednesday, and Lord, we think of the two programs, Good Friday and Easter, and ask that in all these ways we would be glorifying your name. Holy Lord, we think of those who uh, need our prayers. We think of um, uh, Pat Hubbinger, still recovered at home and still unable to come back out here. Uh, we pray for uh, John and uh, Marion Muller and uh, for their uh, issues that have put them into rehab. And Lord, we pray also for um, uh, Diane Cirillo's um, sister, Pat, and pray for her recovery. Lord, we are, are mindful that we are uh, weak vessels of clay, and uh, yet, Lord, uh, we know that you care for us, that you know the number of hairs on our head, and so we just thank you for the love that you have for us. Lord, we just pray that you would be with us now as we hear this message, and that we would take it into our hearts and incorporate it into our lives through this uh, week and the on oncoming days. In your name, amen.
Okay, thank you, Scott. Appreciate that. A fellow wheat, Wheaty, that's what we call us. Uh, when we graduate from Wheaton College, you're a Wheaty. Breakfast of champions, right? That's a, some of the old generation remembers that. Nice to be back with you again here for a second week in a row. I always appreciate the opportunity to minister here at uh, Kenilworth. Uh, this time I brought my wife Cindy with me, so that's good. Uh, family members with me some time to time, and we appreciate the opportunities always to travel together and uh, visit different assemblies of the Lord's people. Now, Scott had mentioned about that webinar. Yes, the webinar is tomorrow night at 9 o'clock. Sometimes we have it at 8 o'clock, but we find that there are some people putting their kids to bed at 8 o'clock, so we said, let's move it ahead to 9 o'clock. By that point, hopefully they've uh, put them in bed, had their devotions, whatever it was. And so that's why uh, we have it set for 9 o'clock tomorrow night. It is a Bible Q&A, and it's a pilot program. We want to see if we want to continue this on a, a, a regular basis. This is an opportunity for you to ask your questions of a, a distinguished panel of experts, quote unquote. Those experts are Jim Compte from Canada, Barry, Ontario, Canada, Sean O'Byrne, some of you know that name, he's a missionary to Belize, has been for many years uh, in Central America, and then Rex Trogdon, some of you know that name as well, and Rex and his wife Nancy are from Charlotte, North Carolina. So these three men have agreed to be a panel on the panel, and we're going to ask them various questions. What are those questions going to be related to? Well, let me ask you a question. If somebody came to you and said, you know, I have a serious issue in my walk with the Lord, I have a problem with assurance of salvation and not really feeling like I'm a true believer, I've gone through these doubts in the last year or so, what would you say to them? In the moment, you may not have five hours to spend with them. You may only have 20 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. What would you say to them? How would you advise somebody about how to live the victorious Christian life? How would you say to somebody, this is how you have victory over temptation? Or what does it mean to walk with the Lord in the light of his word? Or what does it mean to trust the Lord and walk by faith? I mean, we use these terms all the time. But do we really understand what it means? And are we really applying that in our lives? I heard just uh, in our conference that we had at Keswick this past week, Feeding the Flock, when somebody says, you know, are we really true believers or are we practical atheists? Now, what they meant by that phrase is, yeah, we can say we're believers, but are we really walking like the Lord is right there, the unseen hand guiding us and directing us every step of the way? Or do we go about doing our regular business and have a nice little sermon in our mind from what we heard on Sunday morning or Sunday evening or whenever, and, but we're not really applying these truths to our lives? Well, that's what's going to be taking uh, uh, up in our focus tomorrow evening on this webinar. So if you'd like to join us, uh, here's what the flyer looks like. It'll be on the back on the bulletin board. There's a link that you have to click on to register. It's free of charge. It doesn't cost anything. But uh, we have done these webinars with some great success. The Lord has blessed them. They go around the globe, and uh, they are viewed by various people in various uh, countries overseas, as well as right here in the States. So if you'd like to join us, it's only an hour from 9 to 10. Uh, we turn on the TV, we watch our favorite programs at that time. Maybe this would be a great time just to uh, use that. Turn on the TV, it's on YouTube, and uh, listen to this webinar as we take care of some of these topics that we mentioned about. So that's tomorrow night at 9 o'clock. You can register uh, for it. Very simple, it takes about 10 seconds to register. Again, the flyer's in the back. If you need the um, email so you can tap on it, you know, without having to type everything out, you just let us know. We'll be glad to provide that for you. Okay, well, this being Palm Sunday, I thought it would be good to have a message dealing with Palm Sunday. So let's turn our Bibles, please, to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, and this portion in God's Word is Mark's perspective on it. He's got some more details than the book of Matthew, and Matthew has different details than the book of Luke, and Luke has different details from the Gospel of John. Each one of these uh, gospel accounts, as I mentioned last week, gives us different camera views, I like to call it, different angles, different perspectives, highlighting different qualities of the Lord Jesus. So that's why we have four gospels, to give us the same story from four different angles. And that's what's so important for us to understand. So Mark chapter 11, and beginning at verse 1, it says this, Now when they drew near Jerusalem, this is equivalent to today, 
the Sunday before Resurrection Sunday. Now when they drew near Jerusalem to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples. And he said to them, go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you have entered uh, it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it here. Verse 4. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street, and they loosed it. But some of those who stood there said to them, what are you doing, loosing the colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded. So they let him go. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Verse 10, blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. And so when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. And that will certainly uh, conclude our reading at this point, but we'll pick it up in just a few more minutes. I thought with it being Palm Sunday, and of course we get the idea of the origin of that, the people there in Jerusalem laid down these palm branches to welcome the king. At least that's what they did in uh, appearance, in, in profession. But uh, I thought that with it being Palm Sunday, I would like to trace the events of this week as it leads up to the following Friday, this upcoming Friday, as well as the Sunday. Now, this assembly here has a Good Friday service. I'm glad to have that. We've had that for many years at Bethany, a Good Friday service. And, of course, you have a Sunday service. I don't know if you have a sunrise service. We do at Bethany. We take the uh, opportunity to go to the local mausoleum in town that's not too far from the chapel, and we have a service at 7 o'clock in the morning. Now, things are not like it used to be in the past, talking with Brother Martin earlier uh, this morning. Uh, the interest level uh, in the community is not what it used to be. But I remember, have very vivid memories of uh, coming to the uh, sunrise service on a Sunday morning. We had our sunglasses on, and it was 7 o'clock in the morning, and the sun was up, and crowds of people would be there. That post-World uh, War II generation, you know, the greatest generation, they don't call it, right? They were there to honor God and country and everything else. And we took advantage of that opportunity and preach the gospel of Christ, that Christ is risen, is risen indeed. And that's a message that we should never shy away from. It's a message that we should never forget. And uh, Lord willing, all over America next Sunday and all around the globe, there should be that triumphant sound. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And it's a wonderful thing that we can declare that. If we didn't have the resurrection of Christ, what does it say in 1 Corinthians? We'd be of all people, men and women, most uh, pitiful is what the New King James says. It's uh, just definitely a miserable situation if we didn't have the resurrection of Christ. And so, uh, but there were a series of events that occurred all the way through the week that led up to it. And I'd like to take a look at that and trace it through day by day right up to the cross on Friday. So it begins here in Mark chapter 11. And uh, again, this is Mark's account. We're told that uh, they drew near to Jerusalem. It was kind of toward the end of the day. As uh, you see here in verse 11 of this same chapter, chapter 11, it says that when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already late. So it wasn't like Sunday morning like we might think of it. You know, when I was little, we used to go to a denominational church. I uh, didn't really preach the gospel, but they would give us these palm ferns. Anybody remember that? Did you ever get palm ferns? You know, you, you show up, maybe you do it here, I don't know. And it was this, uh, you know, this is Palm Sunday. But it wasn't Sunday morning, it was Sunday evening that see if these events occurred. And it reminds us of what the Lord was doing. He was preparing to come to Jerusalem to announce himself and declare what it is. And we call it triumphant, the triumphal entry of Christ. It's more like a coronation. He's coming in to be observed and declared to be the king. And all the people in unison say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. 
Now, what they were doing, whether you realize it or not, they were quoting from Psalm 118, a great messianic psalm from the Old Testament, written some 800 years before by David. And it was, it's a messianic psalm. It's, uh, David was promised he would have a throne that would go forever and ever. And, of course, David wasn't going to be on a throne, but it's his throne. And so that promise was given. Hosanna and I is blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so that's why uh, we observe it, because that's what the Lord did. And it's part of the Passion Week of Christ, or Holy Week, some circles will uh, declare. Passion Week. Why is it called the Passion? It sounds kind of liturgical. It sounds a, den- a little denominational, like it's part of, uh, you know, the the uh, organized Christianity. No, it is called his passion in Acts chapter 1. You can look it up. Acts chapter 1 verse 2 says that uh, when the Lord rose from the grave, he went back and visited his disciples and he proved himself alive during, after his passion. That's what it says in Acts chapter 1. So we have all authority to say it's a passion week of Christ. And why is it the passion week of Christ? Because Hebrews chapter 12 reminds us that he endured the cross, despised the shame. Now he's set down at the right hand of God. He purged us of our sins, it says in that great chapter, chapter 12 of Hebrews. And so he's done the work. The work is finished. The salvation work of Christ is completed. He said when he hung on the cross, it is finished. He wasn't talking about his life. He was talking about the work of salvation. It is finished. That night, he prayed to the Father in heaven in front of all the disciples. He said, I've finished the work that you gave me to do. What was that work? It was the work of going to the cross to die for your sins and mine. But it all starts out here. Well, it starts out way back in another portion. As a matter of fact, if you were to take the time in John chapter 9, it talks about he set his face as a flint to Jerusalem, steadfast to go to Jerusalem. And so the gospel accounts are just a picture of the Lord's journey from Galilee right on to Golgotha. As a matter of fact, you can trace the seven steps of our Lord from glory then to uh, Galilee, there where he was born in the manger, okay, and his earthly ministry. And then going on from earthly ministry to uh, Gabbatha, that's the place of judgment in front of Pilate. And then Gethsemane, where he cried out, said, Father, if this is your will, uh, you know, I realize that, but not my will, but your be, yours be done. And from Gethsemane to Golgotha, and then from Golgotha to the garden, okay? Or I should say, well, to the garden where there was a grave. And then, of course, back to glory again. And so it's the seven steps of Christ from glory to glory and everything in between. It's a wonderful picture of our Savior and his love and his passion, his mercy and his grace for you. And so I don't know who I'm speaking to in this audience, everyone here in this audience. Maybe all of you know the Lord as your Savior, but maybe statistically there's maybe one, two, three, four, five people in this very audience, the faces I'm looking at right now, that you have not trusted Christ as your Savior. Remember, he died for you. And if you were the only person on earth, he would have gone to the cross for you to die for you and for your sins. And so I hope that strikes home if you haven't bowed the heart and the knee to Christ. And so it's his passion. It's his love for you going to the cross. And it all starts here in chapter 11 of Mark's gospel and other chapters, of course, with the other gospel accounts. And uh, so they come into this area called Bethpage and then uh, into Bethany at the Mount of Olives. And he sent two of his disciples and said, I want you to go get a colt. Now, he could have said, I want you to get the stallion. I mean, that's really the triumphal entry. If you want to talk about the triumphal entry, you turn to the pages of Revelation. When he comes back on a white horse. You know, back in 1917, when the English, the British, captured Jerusalem, so to speak, captured it, it broke the rule of the Ottoman Empire. Any of you history buffs here, Western civilization, would know what I'm talking about. The Ottoman uh, Empire, for a number of years, some five, 600 years, was broken. And so Allenby, the general, said when he was coming through the gates of Jerusalem, he says, I'm not going to come on a, on a horse. He got, deliberately got off his horse and walked that horse through. He says the next person that comes through this place is going to be Christ. He was a believer. 
an acknowledgement of prophetic scripture and revelation where it talks about Christ coming back again in triumph when he comes again the second time. He's going to come through on that white horse. Faithful and true is his name. That's declared there in Revelation chapter uh, 20, uh, 19, I think it is. And so that's the triumphal entry. But here is a coronation. Here is the prelude. Here's the foreshadowing of these events that will occur. And he comes there and he asks for a cult for his disciples to get a cult, in which no one had ever sat on it. There is, a, there is some symbolism here. He would come lowly. It says this in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. Uh, prophetically, Zechariah wrote about this 500 years before, and the Lord was fulfilling prophecy with his very action. And he says, go get this colt. No one has ever used it before, and that's what I'm going to sit on. And that's going to be my entry into this, the meek and lowly Jesus, the one who is the shepherd king, the one that comes lowly and uh, is sitting upon the colt, the foal of a colt, the donkey colt. And he's showing his humility. He's the great and glorious king. He's ultimately high above everything else. And yet he's intimately nigh to those who trust him. He's close in just the mention of his name. That's the savior that we have. The one who rules the land and the sea and everything else. The one that threw the stars in space. That's the great creator God that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. But the one that also speaks to you in your time of need, whatever your need might be. He comes to you, can speak to you, speaks peace to his people, as it says in Psalm 85. And so that's the Savior, and it's a reminder to us as he comes into Jerusalem, he's coming in a meek and lowly, and this is how he comes. His first advent, he comes in like a lamb. His second advent, like a lion. It's like the month of March, right? He comes in uh, opposite the month of March. The month of March comes in like a lion, goes out like a lamb. Well, this is different with Christ. His first advent comes in meek and lowly. But when he comes back again, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And so the Lord Jesus uh, it comes this way, and the people are bowing down to him. And they're putting the ferns down, the branches, the palm branches, and declaring, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I wonder how much true belief there was amongst this group. Because at the end of the week, the whole crowd is saying, crucify him, crucify him. You know, it's always the case. Wherever there's a crowd of people, there may be people who give lip service to the Lord, but they haven't really trusted him in their heart. I talked about this last week. Missing heaven by 18 inches. Why? 18 inches? Just 18 inches? The head and the heart. That's the dis distance between those two things. And so, therefore, you need to ask Christ in your heart. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 says, If we confess in our, uh, with our mouth and believe in our heart that Christ was raised from the dead, we shall be saved. It's belief in the heart. And the next verse, with confession, uh, with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Has to take place in the heart, it's declared and proclaimed, and that seals it. And so that's simple salvation. And yet some of these people obviously didn't know the Lord. They were going through the motions. And so I hope that this morning, that we're not just going through the motions. You have a nice music program here. You got nice surroundings. You all look real nice and smiley and all that sort of thing. You're dressing, looking good and all the rest. <clears throat> but where is your heart? That's the question. Where were the hearts of these people? Were they really there or are they just getting caught up in the groundswell of excitement? It's easy to do. I always tell the story, years ago in Bethany, we had a guy that would come in on a Sunday morning. He'd come in uh, Sunday after Sunday, come down, take a seat in the pew, uh, sing the song, sing the hymns, it sounded really good. And then when they were all finished, he'd get up and walk out. And he did this week after week after week. Finally, one of the elders, you know, elders are not the youngest guys in the world, right? They're not fast runners. But I remember Brother T Taylor, uh, you know, he had to be like 85 years old running after the guy the fourth time trying to track him down in the parking lot. I caught up to him in the parking lot, he did. And he said, why do you leave every week? He says, well, I just like the music. You know? So, you know, he liked the music, but not the message. There's a lot of people that like the music, but they don't want the message and what it means and what it implies. 
And so uh, here, it's a good reminder to us. This very first week of the Passion Week, there can always be the true and the false mingled together, the wheat and the tares. So there's that need for true and real profession of faith. Now, the next day, it says in verse 12, look with me at verse 12, Mark 11, verse 12. It says, the next day when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing uh, from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he could find something on it. When he came to it, he found it, and when he, uh, when he came to it, he found it, nothing but leaves, but it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again, and the disciples heard it. Now, if there's ever a miracle, because this was a miracle, because the Lord spoke to it, and it withered. Later on, we'll read about that, it withered. But the critics of the Bible, you know, the atheists, liberal critics of the Bible, and all the rest, will look at this and say, well... Yeah, that just shows you the Lord. He's impetuous. He's, uh, he's easily angered. He's frustrated and that type of thing. So he curses the fig tree. Well, that's not quite what was going on right here. Because the fig tree, which happened on Monday, now this would be equivalent to tomorrow. Okay? He comes into the temple, presents himself the temple, and then the night comes and they go to bed. Right? And then they wake up the next day and they go out and they see this fig tree. And this fig tree has all the leaves on it, but no fruit. And it was, this, it was the season for, it was not the season for figs, true, but if you have leaves on it, that means there's going to be some budding, some blossoming, showing that their fruit would be coming, not too far away. But there is none. And so the Lord said, this is what is going to happen, that no one eat fruit from you ever again, verse 14. What it pictured symbolically was the work that was going on in the nation of Israel specifically. That even though they had all the promises, even though they had the covenants, uh, Paul writes about this in Romans chapter 9. He had all these blessings, the nation of Israel had all these blessings, yet they didn't produce fruit for the Lord. Now that's a valuable lesson in itself. And it applies to the church just as much as it applies to the nation of Israel. God has shown his goodness to people, taking care of them provided you with a family or with a home and um, perhaps good health and all the rest, his good hand upon you. He's looking to see fruit from the life of a believer. That's what it says in John chapter 15. In John 14, the upper room discourse of Christ, he talks about what he would do for them. But then in chapter 15, it's all turned around what we should do for him. And he says, you should bring forth fruit and not just fruit, but more fruit. And not just more fruit, but much fruit. And he culminates it in verse 8 of that chapter, chapter 15 of John. And he says, here are you, my disciples, if you bear much fruit. He's looking for fruit from the life of a believer. What is fruit? Well, Galatians 5 tells us we have the fruit, not fruits, but fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, that's character. Philippians chapter, one, I mean, Philippians chapter 1, verse 11 says the fruits of holiness. That's outward actions. One is attitudes, the other one's actions. Then it says in Hebrews 15, it says that we should have the fruit of our lips. That's worship. He's looking for worship. And then the next verse says you should share with one another. We do that at Thanksgiving and other times of the year. That's fruit that pleases him. So there's at least four evidences of fruit in the life of the believer. Then over in another passage, he talks about Paul goes into this area called Achaia. It's a region. And he won people to the Lord, and he called them the first fruits of Achaia, the region, leading others to Christ. <clears throat> That's fruit. So how are we doing on our fruit bearing? Do we have the same attitudes? of peevishness, somebody caught you, cut you off on the road, you know, that was my space in the pavement ahead of me here on the Garden State Parkway, what are you doing? We can act just like the regular world out there. Fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, not revenge, not get back, not resentment, and yet we're human, we're like that, we're wired that way. We want to get back when we've been hurt, resentful, but God calls us to a higher level, that you may inherit the blessing. That's what I spoke about last week, remember? Not reviling to, again, but walking in the steps of Christ, 
who when he was threatened, threatened not. When he was reviled, reviled not again, but committed his soul unto him who judges righteously. We should follow those steps. That's fruit bearing. That's a great lesson from this. The Lord is looking for fruit. How many people have you won to Christ? How many have I won to Christ? I'm not, I don't stand here as the expert. I have to ask myself, that's the problem when you preach, you know? You go back and you have a conscience. Even as you speak, the Holy Spirit's throwing, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> and so we need to be bearing fruit for Christ in our attitudes and in our actions and in our converts and in our works and in all the things that we do, bearing fruit for Christ. That's what the Lord wants. And that's what occurred on Monday. There's something else that occurred on Monday, though. If you look with me at verse 13, uh, rather uh, 15, it says, so they came to Jerusalem. This is the same day. This is tomorrow. They came to Jerusalem. Jesus went into the temple, began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And they would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. Then he taught, saying to them, it is... Is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of thieves. <clears throat> He's quoting scripture right there. Verse 18, the scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him because all the people were astonished at his teaching. And when evening had come, he went out of the city. That's Monday. That's the end of the events on Monday. Two recorded events. This first one, the withering of the fig tree, the second one, the cleansing of the temple. Now that sounds strangely familiar to you and you know your Bibles in John chapter two, that's what the Lord did in the beginning of his earthly ministry, three years before. Now this is just before he's gonna to go to the cross and he has to purge it again. Lesson, flag, buzzers, bells. He cleansed it a couple years ago and it's already had to be cleansed again the second time. That's how quick they got back to their old ways. You know, it's, it's easy to get back to your old ways. That's the whole lesson of Egypt to, to Canaan. When the nation of Israel came out of Egypt and they were en route to the promised land, they didn't get too far along in the wilderness and they said, Leo, oh, wish we were back in Egypt again. We had the cucumbers and the leeks and the onions and the garlic, all the spicy things. Oh, why did you kill us? And why are you trying to kill us here, Moses, in the wilderness? Oh, we wish we went back to Egypt. That wasn't too long after they were in the wilderness. And we can be like that too as believers. Trusting the Lord as Savior, wonderful, feel the glow of God upon your life. You answer prayer, a new part of the family of God. I'm so glad to be part of the family of God, we sing. And it doesn't take too long to get back in the old ways of doing things, the music, the friends, whatever. And so here is a reminder to us that that temple needs to be cleansed, the temple of our own selves, our own lives. First Corinthians chapter six says that we are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. This is the temple of God. The Holy Spirit resides within, the Godhead resides within. And that's why when you do something wrong as a Christian, you feel it in your heart because you have a conscience because the Holy Spirit lives in you. And we're told not to grieve or quench the Holy Spirit. It's because he's inside. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. You're an ambassador for Christ. You're a pilgrim and a stranger in this land. You have a new set of standards. So when you try to go back to the way you used to live, it's not going to feel the same way. And the saddest Christian I think there is is one that's got a foot in the world and a foot in the things of uh, uh, Christ. And they're, they're conflicted. And it says in Galatians chapter 5, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The spirit lusts against the flesh, the flesh against the spirit, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Galatians 5, conflicted. And so we need to have the temple cleansed, our temple of our lives. And that's what the lesson comes through very clearly here in this event on Monday. So that's Monday. These are pretty convicting words here, I realize. I'm preaching to myself, just so you know, all right? I'm preaching to myself here. So even Monday, you gotta keep these things, these lessons in mind. Well, what happened on Tuesday? Well, some of these things you see take place here uh, more clearly than others, but in other passages, and I won't turn to it, but uh, in this portion here in Luke 
uh, rather Mark chapter 11, verse 20. It says, now in the morning, that's the key, right? Now in the morning. So now this is Tuesday morning, two days further along. Now the Lord is going to show that he's tested by the religious establishment, the scribes, the elders, and the priests, and all these. They hated him. Okay? And so they're going to challenge him. Now, you don't see it as much here in Mark's gospel as you do, let's say, in Luke's gospel, who brings out a different perspective. But from this portion here in verse 20 of Mark 11, right on through to uh, chapter 12, actually into uh, chapter 13, you have the Lord being tested as an orchestrated strategy by the religious establishment to try to trip them up. They're going to start asking hypothetical questions. Hey, Lord, what happens about this person? He, he, she's married to somebody, and then the husband dies. And she remarries again. And then he dies. And she remarries again. And she does this seven times. Boy, that's an active person right there, right? Then when she gets to heaven, who's her husband? What do you say to that, Lord? That's what they were trying to do. They were, they were deliberately making things up to try to trip them up. Now, this is in keeping with what we see in Exodus chapter 12 in the Passover lamb. We don't have time to look into it. But you just make a note of it. Look at uh, Exodus chapter 12. When Moses got the instructions for the Passover lamb, they were to take a lamb, a male of first year, without any blemish at all, without any imperfections. And they were to have that lamb and keep it for four days and examine it carefully to make sure it was without blemish. And then they were to sacrifice and it would be the Passover lamb that would cover them. The, the blood was a, put upon the doorpost, if you recall, in the uh, Passover feast. Not only the event, but then the feast that followed afterwards. And then the death angel would pass over them because the blood had been applied. It's a great picture of the blood applied in the, of Christ, the blood applied to your life and mine. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And so the Passover lamb, though, had to be examined and shown to be the perfect sacrifice <clears throat> for that Passover. And what's going on on Tuesday is this cross-examination by the religious establishment to try to trip him up. And he didn't get tripped up at all because he's the perfect son of God without sin, shown to be indeed sinless. And so, even though we won't look into the details here, he is asked various questions, and he's shown to be the Son of God without sin. So that way, we know that when he went to the cross on Friday, he would be the perfect sacrifice for sin. And uh, he taught some of these things. One of the things he taught during Tuesday was what's called the Olivet Discourse. He went over to the Mount of Olives, and if you've ever been to Israel, you just go off from the city and you go down this ravine, you can walk it, you know, and come up the other side. There's a valley there and come up the other side. It'd be like from here to the parkway. It's not that far away, but it goes down in elevation. And you come up the other side and there's the Mount of Olives. And from there he gave the Olivet Discourse. The extended version of the Olivet Discourse is found in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. And if you ever want a handle on prophetic scripture, you make sure you study that portion. Matthew 24 and 25, called the Olivet Discourse. And that's what occurred on Tuesday. And he laid it all out. And he looked at the temple. He could look at the temple like I'm looking at houses over there. And he would say to his disciples, see that temple, glorious temple, built by Herod, refurbishment of a previous temple from Herod, uh, Solomon's day. He said, you see that temple, glorious as it is? Not one stone is going to be on top of another in that temple. It's going to be destroyed. The disciples said, how can you say that? Look at the temple. It's power, it's solid. How's it going to fall? Well, it fell under the Romans in, Ro in AD 70. Romans knew just what to do to take the whole thing, dismantle that temple right down. Huge stones weighing tons, and they were able to pull it off. You know, you know, we get the idea that we are the experts in technology. You know, I get the, you know, the people that built the pyramids, you know, they, boy, they had everything down. 
We, we, we think that they are backwoods, no way, previous generations. And so with Solomon's temple and even Herod's temple that was standing in the Lord's day, you could go there and you could you can even put, and when it was rebuilt to what it is today at the Dome of the Rock in Israel, you can't put a piece of paper between those stones. They're so precision oriented. There's no gap in it. You can't even put this piece in my notes. You couldn't even put in between those rocks. They had it all down. But the Lord looking at that temple says there's not going to be one stone upon it. It was incredulous to the disciples. And yet that's what the Lord taught. And that's what happened on Tuesday. No big event that occurred, but a lot of teaching occurred on Tuesday. Well, what happened on Wednesday? Well, Wednesday, two events occurred. And uh, they are reminded, we're reminded by the letter A, the anointing of Mary by Mary and the agreement for Judas to betray the Lord. Those two great events that occurred, the anointing of Mary. <clears throat> now that's found in Mark chapter 14. So just shoot ahead real briefly to Mark chapter 14. There you will read, uh, well, this is going to be the, the portion here in verse 3. Mark chapter 14, verse 3. <clears throat> this is going to happen on Wednesday. I won't take the time to, to go through it and put it forth, but verse 3. Being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. That's a perfume. And she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there are some who were indignant among themselves and said, Why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. That's a lot of money. And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always. And whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me, you have always. And she has done what she could. She came beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Shortly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, What this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. The anointing of Christ by this oil, prefiguring his death. The nation of Israel came in thinking they're going to have a world leader, and she comes in and worships him and bows at his feet, anoints his head with oil, picturing his death. And this was a great work that was done. Keep your finger right here on Mark chapter 14. Turn with me for a moment to John chapter 12. Turn with me to John chapter 12. I want to show you something. The events of this woman being anointed with oil speaks of the priority of worship. The Lord was putting the stamp of approval on this and saying, this is it. The most important thing is worship course giving to the work of the Lord financially is important fellowship is important serving the Lord is important all those things are important but the highest priority is worship that's why we have that worship meeting every week Acts 20 verse 7 says on the first day of the week the disciples came together to break bread that's not quarterly they come together quarterly and come together twice a year and come together on holidays they came together on the first day of the week to worship the Lord, to break bread. Now, in John chapter 12, we have in picture here the priority of worship. Look with me at these words. John chapter 12, verse 1. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was who had been dead, from whom he had raised from the dead. And look at this. They made him a supper, and Martha served. Two words, Martha served. That's service, two words. But Lazarus, one of those who sat at the table with him, I count it right, 12 words, 11, 12 words. That's fellowship. When you sit down and have a meal with somebody, that's fellowship. Two words for service, 12 words for fellowship. But then look what it says here in verse three. Then. Mary took a pound of very costly oil, a spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. That's 39 words. You see the priority of worship? Worship 
gets 39 words. Fellowship gets 12. Service gets two. All are important, but the priority is worship. And that's what the Lord wants to impress upon us on this Wednesday of the Passion Week. The priority of worshiping the Lord and acknowledging what he has done for us in his death. That's what Mary did here in Mark chapter 14. So the priority of worship is another key event that occurs. Another event that occurs on Wednesday of this Passion Week is the agreement by Judas to betray the Lord. And uh, this is what happens going back now to Mark chapter 14. Look with me at verse 10. Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. So he sought how he might conveniently betray him. Why did Judas do this? Well, we're told that he wasn't a believer. That's a lesson. Twelve disciples, one of them is Judas. All that Judas witnessed, the miracles of Christ, everything, the words of Christ, the miracles, the message, all these things, and he didn't trust the Lord, he still was keeping his heart barricaded against the things of Christ. Don't let your heart be barricaded against the things of Christ. You can come in and hear a message and a message, but you need to, like the scripture, my son, give me thine heart. He wants our lives. He wants our hearts. And Judas, even though he was a witness to all these things, didn't open his heart and life to Christ. Wow, that's a destiny in action right there. And that's what happened with Judas. Our time is fleeting on right here, and we have to wrap up. But that was Wednesday. So what happens Thursday? The next thing that happens on Thursday, of course, is what we call Monday Thursday is, is what the Christian world calls it, a sorrowful day. Indeed, it was. But it happened at night. The Last Supper was inaugurated. The Lord just took his disciples, including Judas. But at a certain point, Judas vacates the company of believers. Then he gives the bread and the wine. It's four believers only. Judas left. That's a key thing to keep in mind. And he begins to open up the teachings of Scripture that were expounded upon or expanded upon by Paul. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. That's what he said to his disciples. That's the rapture of the church. Now, that's just a, an embryo form, and Paul would expand upon that Later on, a couple different scriptures. But that and some other things, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, all spoken about in the upper room discourse. That's found in John chapter 13 through 17. John's gospel focuses on that angle that Mark and Luke and Matthew don't. Gives wonderful ministry and explanation of those things. I really would encourage you to read that portion. That happens on Thursday, but we know Thursday kept on going into the night. There would be then the actual betrayal by Judas that night. And then in front of uh, these guards at the fire where Peter denied the Lord. Believers can under pressure cave to the pressures of the world. That could, that could have been my message this whole morning. Don't cave to the pressures of the world. Stay strong for the Lord. Be steadfast in the faith. Don't let the enemy come in and speak to your heart lies. Don't listen to those things that are in the world that are contrary to the scripture. Stay true to the Lord. But Peter is a reminder to us that even the best can waffle. Even the best can trip up. But you know what? Praise the Lord. John 21. He's recommissioned. He's restored back to the faith. Praise the Lord for that. And look what happened with Peter. Became a powerful witness. 3,000 people come to know the Lord at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. What a great message. We don't have to go home, do we? We can just keep on going, right, today? I mean, that's a powerful message and a positive message. 
that everyone in this room needs to hear. You may have started out well in life. There's no plan B, C, D, E, or F. There's God's grace and mercy, which endures to all generations. His grace is powerful. His grace and mercy, mercy triumphs over judgment, it says in James chapter 2. So don't ever count yourself out. God's got a great plan for you. All you have to do is come to him and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I really messed up. And the Lord says, you're restored. All you have to do is have the heart to do it. It's a great lesson. But Peter wept bitterly when he realized what he did against the Lord. It's a whole great message in there. Now, that was Thursday night. The Lord brought before Pilate and Herod and then Pilate. There were six trials that took place that night. Six. Before the Sadducees, before Annas, before Caiaphas, before Pilate, before Herod, before Pilate. Six altogether. Miscarriage of justice all the way. And it resulted in the verdict he would be crucified on that Friday, what we call Good Friday. Good to us, tough for him. But he endured the cross, despised the shame, knowing the joy that was set before him. Isaiah 53 talks about it. He shall see his seed and shall rejoice. Those who are knowing the Lord Jesus as Savior, he sees the seed of his work taking place. And so there he hung on the cross on Friday with a huge crowd of people all around him. You analyze it in Luke chapter 23, there's seven different types of people that are around that cross. That's a representation of the cross section of all humanity. The soldiers, the rulers, the people who stood be holy, not knowing what was going on. Those who were close by, those who stood afar off. The centurion said, certainly this was a righteous man. All a thief on one hand, a thief on the other. The repentant one, the unrepentant one. All these different types of people. All different types of people being represented by that crowd at the cross. The crowd at Calvary in Luke chapter 23. And he was there hanging for you and for me. And that's the Passion Week of Christ. And you'll get the rest of the story on Friday right here. And on Sunday, three days later, when he rose from the grave. Praise the Lord for a wonderful Savior. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your grace, for your mercy, for the truth that we see from your word, for the events of the Passion Week that we see that led up to that tremendous transaction that took place on what we call Good Friday, when he would die there for our sins and for all the sins of the world. For any who would come and trust him as Savior, those sins are completely put away. And uh, the wrong is made right. And Father, the restoration process begins. We thank you for that glorious truth, those glorious promises of your word. Pray, Father, that as these words go out, wherever they may be, that it would find entrance into the heart of those who really want to live for you and walk with you. So we give you thanks in our Savior's name.